Hello, good evening and welcome to The Stance live here on TV3. My name is Parker Siasari. Thanks very much for making a date with us here on the program. We're live from the News Hub at Adesawa in Kanda Kram. You can also watch us live on your DSTV channel 279 and on Facebook Live. Tonight we'll be joined by my colleague Noan Falong and Alfred Okanse, both of the business desk. But before we delve into matters for tonight, let's begin with local news highlights. Tonight, government will, int will not introduce new taxes in the 2020 fiscal year. Presenting the 2020 budget to Parliament, Finance Minister Kenneth Foriata said government will restructure the tax system by developing a comprehensive revenue policy and strategy to address the challenges of revenue mobilization. Also tonight, the Supreme Court has dismissed an application filed by the Special Prosecutor Martin Amidu, which sought to enforce the Attorney General to retrieve judgment debt owed Waterville Holdings. The Apex Court in its ruling described the application as incompetent and had no basis on any rule of law. Our Lady of Fatima, a private basic school at Pong in the Lower Manyakroba municipality of the Eastern Region has been temporarily closed down. The closure, which will last for two weeks, is to prevent further spread of the H3N2 influenza. And Ghana coach Chris Yapia has called on the Black Stars to put smiles on the faces of Ghanaians after the warm reception they received while on the journey to Cape Coast. The Stars opened their 2021 qualifying series against South Africa on Thursday night and the Stars are poised to start on a perfect note. Right, so those were highlights of local news making headlines. Let's find out what's been happening on the international front today. And two U.S. diplomats told the impeachment investigation targeting President Donald Trump on Wednesday that he created an irregular channel to deal with Ukraine. William Taylor, the current top American diplomat in Ukraine, and George Kent, who oversees Ukraine affairs, said that over time they came to realize that uh, Golani, uh, the New York mayor, was acting at Trump's behest outside normal State Department confines, sidelining normal relations between Washington and Kiev. Also tonight, the Trump administration proposed a regulation on Wednesday that would bar most asylum seekers from applying for a work permit if they enter the United States illegally. The proposal would allow immigration authorities to reject an asylum application or work permit request uh, and migrants who miss related immigration appointments. Opposition to the plan is expected from immigration lawyers and former immigration judges. Now, a second Ebola vaccine is to be offered to around 50,000 people in the Democratic Republic of Congo as part of a major clinical trial. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine will be used alongside a vaccine made by Merck, which has already been given to around 250,000 people. More than 2,100 people have died in DR Congo in the second largest Ebola outbreak on record. And very finally, cross-border violence between Israel and militants in Gaza is continuing a day after an Israeli airstrike killed a Palestinian Islamic Jihad commander. After an overnight lull, uh, rocket fire towards Israel resumed and Israeli aircraft conducted retaliatory strikes. Gaza's health ministry said 14 Palestinians have been killed by Israeli fire on Wednesday, bringing the death toll there to 24 since Tuesday. Well, that's it for the international news highlights for today. Remember, you're watching The Stance Live here on TV3. We're streaming live on Facebook, also live on your DSTV channel 279. We'll take
kept saying, may you that day sambe wa me. But was it as simple as that? All right, you're welcome back to The Stance Live here on TV3. It's a weekly program where we get to interact with our journalists, our media men, uh, to also share their thoughts on major stories that have been running throughout the week. And of course, today, we've been very heavy on the budget presentation by Finance Minister Ken Oforiata. Uh, all throughout the day, we've been covering it, uh, bringing you back-to-back -back coverage uh, from the House of Parliament and right here in our studios. My, my colleague, Alfredo Kante, and the rest of the business team were right here in the studio uh, while myself and the other, uh, the rest of the team uh, were stationed at the Parliament House. So. What's been happening today? Finance Minister Kenneth Ferreira has presented a 2020 budget statement themed consolidating the gains for growth, jobs, prosperity for all. The first budget of the Akufuado led government has uh, a theme sowing uh, seeds for growth and jobs. That for 2018 was themed putting Ghana back to work, whilst uh, uh, 2019 the budget was themed a stronger economy for jobs and prosperity. Tonight, we'll look at the plans to deal with revenue shortfalls and declining capital expenditure and see whether or not they are feasible. Right, so government says it will not introduce new taxes in the 2020 fiscal year. Presenting the 2020 budget to Parliament, Finance Minister Ken Oferreta said government will restructure the tax system by developing a comprehensive revenue policy and strategy to address the challenges of revenue mobilization. Mr. Speaker, as you can see, we have not imposed any new taxes. He said government would give the necessary support to the Ghana Revenue Authority to boost revenue collection to enable it meet its targets. The focus will be on efficiency and base broadening rather than imposing new taxes on our people and businesses. But the Communications Minister Ursula Usu in her reaction wants government to consider taxing mobile money profits made by the telecommunication companies to show up national revenue. What I have been advocating, and I'll continue to advocate for it, is that the revenue that the companies earn from the transaction fees that you and I pay, they're earning upwards in the region of about 80 million CDs every month, and they are paying nothing. Any company that operates and earns revenue in this country is required by law to pay taxes on it. So I'm urging GRA to sit down with them and work out some arrangement by which government can also derive its fair share. All right, so apologies for that initial, uh, you know, mix up there in the introduction. But uh, if you just join us, this is a stance, our weekly program here on TV3, where we afford our journalists and editors an opportunity to also share the views and opinions of running national issues. Today, we've been very heavy on the budget discussion. Finance Minister Ken Oferreta was in Parliament to present the 2020 uh, budget statement and economic policy. And um, my colleague in the studio, Alfredo Kanse, uh, he has been following this, uh, uh, you know, quite strongly. Alfred, so I know you monitored this uh, presentation. Um, what's your own view of the 2020 uh, budget statement and economic policy? Thank you, Pa. Um, as always, uh, good evening, and it's always good to be here. But I think that the, the, the summary, from my perspective, uh, considering the fact that this is the first post-IMF budget uh, for Ghana by this administration and obviously uh, the last for the first term of this ecofoado led administration and to the extent that this is considered as an election budget, the number of things that you would have expected to see in there, um, you know, the economists have not been very excited about the level of capital expenditure going down because if you look at it over the 2019 fiscal year and then the 2018 fiscal year we've been down for about 44 percent in deviation of of fiscal uh, i mean capital expenditure and there are those who argue that look if you, you cannot keep suppressing capital expenditure for the lack of better expression and want to still uh, see a certain level you know of development so I was hoping to see 
uh, more of an elaborate, you know, uh, plan for capital expenditure in this 2020 budget. But I think it was it was a bit flat for the lack of better expression on that particular score. For revenue generation, there are many who have described the 67.1 billion revenue target as overly ambitious because uh, if you look at this uh, that for 2020 fiscal year for the 2019 fiscal year the revenue target was about 58 billion and already the gra did indicate us at mid-year this year that um, they, they had fallen short of about 5 billion uh, the, for, for the mid-year target so if all things remain as they are or as you know we, we, we say all things being equal they may not i mean government may not meet the target set for this 2019 fiscal year but you ask yourself what exactly went into that particular target of 67.1 billion government is saying that as you read earlier they're going to roll out some measures that would help in increasing you know revenue generation you know over and above what we've seen over the period and so for me i'm looking to see those measures going forward into the next 12 um, calendar months that we have ahead of us uh, into an election year for mm -hmm. that matter and especially because new taxes have not been introduced and so you would want to see government indeed come out with the detail of the innovative ways that they want to employ to actually increase revenue internally and especially because of the Ghana Beyond Aid agenda we are you know, expected to be very heavy on internal revenue generation. And so it's, it's a problem if over the period you still not, are not able to achieve uh, your revenue target. But that said, if you look at uh, the revenue that we even generate, I mean, 40% goes into debt servicing and about 30% is used for salary payments and the rest is for regulatory transfers. So that computation in itself also gives us a broader understanding of where we are going or what we are actually using our revenues for. Now, if you look at certain measures that were employed in the 2019 fiscal year to help us increase revenue, because we keep talking about expanding the tax net, and this is one particular thing that the 2019 budget contained, and the media budget review actually indicated that as well. I mean, but I always say that you cannot, you cannot quantify what you haven't identified, or you cannot measure what you can't quantify and eventually haven't identified. So that if we're expanding the tax net, what, where are we expanding it to? I mean, if we expand it and we are not able to identify the taxable population, then we'd only be expanding it and not reaching any targets because then we are not targeting specific persons. Mm. And that's why, you know, the introduction of the Ghana Post GPS the national identification exercise, which was also supposed to help in identifying people who are supposed to pay taxes who are not paying taxes, and then also um, you know the, the tax identification number, the TIN, which the GRA has been very very heavy on over the last few months, closing down companies and finding some of them as well. Um, if you do a review of these three interventions that were meant to you know help increase internal revenue, you would say that some of them haven't really worked to to the maximum expected you know levels you know for example Ghana Post GBS national identification exercise is still facing challenges you know these were interventions that were supposed to contribute in identifying you know taxable population that we know that if we're expanding the tax net these are the persons that we are going to pay taxes who who are who can pay taxes who are not actually paying taxes. So right. that, that's something that we could also look at. Right. The property tax, I know that, I mean, the, some time ago they piloted these drones to help in identifying property and then putting some rates to it. That, that didn't really work, you know. So property taxes is an area we can look at. I mean, these are some lands in prime, prime, prime areas that are, that are not being utilized and are there. What are also those ones being used for? Why don't we consider ways of actually taxing them? So these are areas I'm just hoping that, you know, as government said, they're going to look at innovative areas of generating revenue for this um, 67.1 billion target to be reached. We'll yeah, see yeah, how it you're goes. Still, you're still talking about taxation. And, and I mean, you know, for this particular government, you know, before they even came to power, they, you know, raised a lot of concerns about nuisance taxes mm -hmm. because we know the previous government had, uh, you know, it kind of instituted very audacious tax policies 
and you know then the NPP in opposition thought that some of them were nuisance taxes and so once they came into power they took off some of them and I, now you're talking about uh, taxing um, properties I, well, I, I, I recently read um, <coughs> something from uh, Mr. Pieni uh, Kwame Pieni suggesting that we could be taxing undeveloped properties for yes. instance um, there's so many of them I'd want to take the discussion uh, from the, the the whole theme mm -hmm. or, you know of the of the budget, which which has to do with consolidating the gains that, but since you've introduced, um, uh, you know, revenue generation, all that, maybe we, we could start from there. So um, essentially, uh, when you look at the figures, um, government is projecting a revenue of sixty-seven point one billion, yes, um, which is far in excess of what you know was was uh, targeted for twenty nineteen, mm -hmm. which is about fifty-four point six uh, billion cities. Uh, mm -hmm. And out of the 67.1 billion cities for 2020, we know domestic revenue uh, alone accounts for about 65.8 yes. billion. And then uh, the remainder uh, uh, is, is coming from grant mm -hmm. disbursement from Absolutely. our donor partners. Mm -hmm. That's about 1.2 billion, billion cities. And, and interesting, when you compare that to the 2019 figure uh, for uh, grant disbursement, it was um, 833.1 million cities. Mm -hmm. So you can see a little increase in the disbursements uh, from our donor partners. Absolutely. Now, you know that since we became a, a lower middle income economy, certainly all those you know, support that we, we've been having from our donor partners has, has had to you know, decrease significantly. Mm -hmm. And so we're not having much coming in from, from our donor partners. And so that, that puts a lot of pressure on us as a country to get a lot more from internally generated uh, funds. Mm -hmm. Now, out of this... Um, 67.1 billion cities that we're targeting as revenue, government is uh, hoping to expand some 85.9 billion cities. And a chunk of this, like you mentioned yeah. earlier on, is going to wage bill payment, into wage, the wage bill, uh, interest payments, as well as uh, election uh, expenditure for, for 2020. But you raised a very critical matter, which has to do with um, our revenue generation. Now, it would interest you to know that the finance minister indicated that uh, one of the things that they were, they're looking, you know, moving forward at, at doing is to increase our tax to GDP ratio. Um, currently, it's below 13% to somewhere around 20%. So, currently, our tax to GDP ratio is 13%. They're hoping that it will increase 20%. Now, essentially, tax to GDP ratio um, is a nation's, uh, you know, tax, you know, in, in, in relation to its gross domestic product. So um, it's assumed that once your GDP is high, that your taxes will be high. Mm -hmm. Once your GDP is low, your tax will be low. Now, I did a bit of research uh, analyzing um, Ghana's tax to GDP ratio uh, since 2000. I see. The lowest we've had so far was 11% in 2000. Mm. That's our tax to GDP ratio. And since 2000, it's been increasing. The highest was in 2016, which was 17.6%. In 2015, it was seven, so in, in 2000, it was 11%, which is the lowest. In 2015, it was 17.2%. And then in 2016, it shot up to 17.6%. And that's the highest. Mm -hmm. Now, interestingly, our highest tax to GDP ratio in 2016 was far lower than the average of 21 African countries. Even our highest of 70.6% was far lower than the average of 21 African countries. Now, let me just give you, um, you know, <laughs> some, of, some of these countries, for instance. Now, it would interest you to know that this is 2016. Tunisia. Tunisia has a tax to GDP ratio of 29.4%. Mm. South Africa has a tax to GDP ratio. That's in 2016, 28.6%. Yeah. Morocco, tax to GDP, 26.4%. Togo, our own neighboring Togo, tax to GDP ratio 2016 was 22.2 percent. Senegal 22 percent, Mauritius 20 percent, um, Burkina Faso 18.1 percent, Ghana 17.6. So, when you compare all these figures mm -hmm. for 2016 alone, you'd notice that even our highest of 17.6 percent was lower than the average of all these 21 African countries. So it tells you that there's a lot of work there that we need to do. We need to increase our tax to GDP ratio. And I think that, 
you know, one of the things we can concentrate on is, is value addition, you know, production. Yeah. They talk about production, for instance, mm -hmm. and, you know, industrialization, which the government is championing. You look at cocoa, for instance, a lot of work has been done now. The president was at uh, the, uh, the, the Africa Investment Summit in, in South Africa talking about the fact that, look, Ghana and Ivory Coast together uh, produce about 60% of the world's cocoa. But how much do we get, for instance? Mm -hmm. Switzerland, they don't produce any cocoa. But the, kind of the, 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 the economy for chocolate alone is worth about $100 billion. And we're just making about $2, $2 billion. So um, I guess we both agree that we need to Certainly. increase our tax to GDP ratio. We need to increase um, revenue generation and... Um, a lot of measures have, have, have been, okay, uh, I'm just, the producer was saying something. Okay, so. Okay, okay, Afra, go ahead. Well, well, yes, I mean, but you've talked about the tax of GDP, mm -hmm. I mean, yes, and uh, the reason why I zeroed in on revenue generation mm -hmm. is because really, I mean, we're getting into 2020, and, and mm. as you said, this is an election year. Government will definitely be spending, and as a matter of fact, it's captured in the budget. This mm. year, for instance, total revenue and grants in the first half of 2019 reached about 22.7 billion, mm. below the projected 26.9. Mm. Okay, mm. and it, there is the clear fear that that 58.8 billion you know, revenue target will be missed. Mm. And so if all things being equal, the revenue target will be missed. Government is saying that in the year 2020, although they hope to raise 67.1 billion CDs uh, mm. revenue target, mm. they're actually hoping to spend 85.9 billion, suggesting that they would actually spend 18.8 billion more than the revenue that is expected to be generated in 2020 mm. so that clearly tells you that i mean even in even though we have this target spending would exceed revenue or mm. expenditure for that matter will exceed revenue. but, but you also raise a, quick, a, a critical point i mean all this revenue that we're raising where is it going into you know well and and, and the key I mean, and, and that's key, key, the, the, key issue here is that and, and, and you enumerate them mm -hmm. a lot of this is going to consumption as much which, of which is not generating much Capital expenditure, like you mentioned, mm -hmm. has been, you know, reduced significantly. And so we have the free SHS, for instance. We have a chunk of the, uh, uh, we have the banking sector reforms, you know. And, and, and as a finance minister stated, the cost of the banking sector reforms added to all the legacy debt over the period is somewhere around 33 billion cities to the taxpayer. That's a whopping 33 billion cities. Oh, yes. The, the legacy debt... Actually, the total cost of the cleanup, he put it to 16.4 billion. No, in, addition I'm, I'm, to in addition to the legacy, the, the, debt, the it legacy says about 33 debt. billion. So, th those like mm. there are two components put together. Mm. So, if you look at the total cost, I mean, updated cost we have right now, as he mentioned, was 16.4 in addition to legacy, then you get the 33 billion yeah. that you're talking about. Yeah. But yes, that I mean, the gains of this, this banking sector cleanup juxtapose it with the cost so you do a pro pro and uh, calls analysis and find out whether indeed it was worth go going or expending this money in mm. there some other think otherwise but if you look at the the kind of situation that we have saved ourselves from according to the finance minister and many who indeed believe that this was a very necessary venture then all things being equal, we could have actually lost more if we had allowed the situation to remain as it is. So there, there's expenditure that is necessary. The point I'm trying to make is that if you look at the breakdown of what actually the revenue is used for, 40% mm. actually goes into debt servicing. And the interest on the loans that we have acquired as a country 30% goes into salaries mm. and then the rest are regulatory transfers. Clearly, if we want to generate revenue, we must know where we are putting our money and the results thereof. You know, because we will generate the revenue. Look at the, the, the ports. Mm. Today I was talking about the ports because when we introduced the paperless ports, 
in three months, the first quarter after the introduction, mm. we saw an astronomical increase in revenues from the ports. Mm. That clearly tells you that that, that intervention was necessary. Mm. Okay, I know that the Institute of Statistical, Social and Economic Research at Legon is doing some work on the total benefits that we have actually gained as a country in introducing the paperless ports to regulate, you know, revenue generation at the mm. ports and other measures. So I'll wait for that particular result and find out how significant it has actually been in contributing mm. to uh, a revenue generation. Because in effect, there are those who also raise questions about tax exemptions. And, mm. and pa, I remember, I think yesterday or two days ago, we were having a conversation about these tax exemptions and how it's increasing over the period. Mm. I didn't hear anything. You were in Parliament. I listened and watched over here. Mm. I didn't really hear anything about the AGI, for example, saying that government should look, take a look at the tax exemptions. Mm. Um, as to whether indeed it is necessary. I mean, the Free Zones Board I mean, Free Zones Authority, I beg your pardon, thinks that our tax exemption regime is actually lower than other countries, even within the sub-region. And so even reviewing it and making it going down further is not going to help the situation in terms of attracting investors into the country. Okay. But then, if you give okay. these tax exemptions to, mm. to companies mm. who come in mm. into the Free Zones enclave with a particular business module, they get in and then the business module changes mm -hmm. and they get into retail and other areas. The objective of giving these tax exemptions is defeated because we are not gaining anything as a country. All right, let's, let's move forward. Um, let's, let's talk about these uh, gains that the, the government is trying to consolidate. Uh, so, uh, I mean, since the NPP took part in 2017, um, let's just look a bit of... Uh, Let's look at the figures, for instance, uh, in terms of macroeconomic stability, which uh, the, the finance minister uh, talks a lot about. Um, so we've seen growth averaging around 7% um, compared to 3.4% um, in December 2016. Inflation, for instance, uh, we know uh, as at September is at single digits, that's 7.6% from the 15.4% that they inherited in December. Uh, you look at the treasury bill rate, for instance. Um, um, it's currently around 14.7% from the 17% that, 17% um, uh, in, in December 2016. Uh, you take a look at the fiscal deficit, for instance, and um, over the last three years, it's been kept below 5%. And just as September 2019, uh, we know that it was about 4.5%. Um, when you look at the inflation, the fact that we have a single digit inflation, I think it's good news. Uh, obviously, inflation over a period uh, is a general increase in price levels over a period of time. And so once you have inflation coming down, it's good because then your purchasing power also increases. Mm -hmm. In terms of the treasury bill rates, I mean, from about 17% in 2016 to 14.7%, that's, that's interesting. That means that, look, we're not seeing that much of government borrowing on the local market, which often will crowd out the private sector. Well, that's actually... And, it is and no, no mm -hmm. uh, you don't expect any bank to, to, to lend below the treasury bill rate. Now we're yeah. seeing uh, uh, interest rates moving around 23 24%, and that's, that's positive news. Uh, for the economy. You, you wanted to say something quickly, just come in. I, well, well, yeah, apart with respect to the issue of, um, you know, all these factors, you've inflation, mm. the reduction in, in the treasury bill rates and others mm. are supposed to directly feed into, you know, the cost of credit, you know, all things being equal, mm. you know. But then again, there are other factors that f banks consider in computing their interest rates on but the to be loans fair, that... But to be fair, that to be fair interest rates have come down. I mean, wait, from about the average of 30% but then again, to, to somewhere around it, it, 23, 24. If, it it, can, it look, can be better, but it's, 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 far, it's, far, it's good. It's good. It, it, I mean, it, it is, it is if you, you want to be very charitable to the banks. But, mm. but really, you, when you speak to them, other factors that goes into the computation of the, 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 the rates, the interest rates on the loans that they advance to the private sector. Because when the first budget that this administration read 
and I think the 2018 budget as well, clearly gave a signal that government was committed to reducing the cost of credit. But if you do, if you juxtapose the reduction over the period, over 750 basis points, okay, in, that has influenced this whole... Reduction in what? You're talking in, about in, the policy in the, rate? In the policy rate. Mm -hmm. And this is the rate that the, the banks actually do borrow from the central bank, mm -hmm. right? You will not see the same rate of reduction, you know, if as the banks are advancing credit to the private sector. You will not expect that it actually will be the same over 750 basis point. No. No, but Alfred, The point is that there Alfred, are other but, things... But, but you I mean, are just I, I, saying... I, I was just... You, you just I, say that... Well, you, you just say that we're coming from a period where we had interest rates somewhere hovering around 30, 35 percent. You see, but now I was if, 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 if interest rates have come down to about 24, 25 percent, that should be good news. As against the over almost 800 basis points reduction in the policy rate. I mean, I, if you I, want to go into that I, analysis, I think, I think, I think the, finance minister, the, the finance minister did allude to the fact that it can get better. Yes, that's but, actually the problem. But, but there are a number of factors, like you mentioned, that would go into interest For example, the, 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 the levels of risk, which the banks actually take into consideration, which, which is understandable. The point I'm trying to make is that I am not overly you know, being critical of the banks mm. in mm. having their interest mm. rates at that. Mm. And I would ascribe mm. to every other position that, say, that would say that mm. it could get better. In fact, it has to get better if indeed mm. the trend continues. If we continue to see a reduction in the policy rate, mm. it, it has been maintained over the period. Mm. If we see a reduction, then we must see some responses from the bank. But the other mm. point that you make about government you know, now the market's actually being freed up for the private sector to, to, to be able to borrow. It's actually contrary to, to the Bank of Ghana's report two months ago. Mm. So the banks are more comfortable now lending to government. And I must mm. tell you mm. that the private sector is still to an extent crowded out. In the, in the, in the, in the credit market, mm. they are still not having you know, real access to the credit. I mean, the cost of credit now, really, the banks are finding more convenient mm. to lend to government. And so I am hoping to see government getting out and allowing, not crowding out the private sector, mm. allowing the market, freeing up the market for the private sector to actually do business. All right. So um, that's, that's, you're still that's watching that's the Stance Live here on TV3. Um, I guess in the studio, Alfred Okante, is with a business desk here at TV3 and myself. Uh, we'll take a short break. When we return, we'll do a lot more of the budget analysis. <laughs> All right, you're welcome back to The Stance Live here on TV3. Tonight we're taking a look at the presentation of the 2020 uh, Budget and Economic Statement by Finance Minister Ken Oforiata. Uh, I'm here with Alfred Okante. We're taking a look at some of the issues that were raised in the 2020 budget. Although there were no new um, tax introductions, uh, one thing was clear that the Finance Minister intends to implement a number of policies that would uh, see us increase our revenue generation. Uh, there are plans to essentially look at the whole tax administration to broaden the tax net and to have a lot more people, uh, you know, paying taxes uh, instead of uh, putting pressure on the very few people. Also, uh, the finance minister was quite clear that there was also a need to increase our tax to GDP ratio. Currently, is below 13 percent, and uh, we're targeting about 20 percent uh, moving forward. Alfred, uh, so. Um, moving into 2020, a number of targets. We're looking at uh, real GDP growth of about 6.8%, non-oil growth 6.7%, inflation 8%, fiscal deficit 4.7% uh, of GDP, uh, primary surplus of 0.7%. Uh, the big question is, particularly for fiscal deficits, and as we all know, <coughs> in election years, governments are always tempted to overspend uh, their budget. Um, Thankfully, we have a fiscal responsibility law in place. Will we keep to this? <laughs> well, government is confident. They, well, the finance minister, the president, over the last 48 hours have reiterated that commitment to obey this law and also 
uh, adhere to the advice of the Fiscal Responsibility Council mm. that has been established. Mm. And I think it would be very, very unfortunate and, and a clear detriment to the Ghanaian people if after a law has been established, a committee has, in fact, a council has been put in place then we go ahead and still violate the law with impunity. I mean, that, that clearly wouldn't... I mean, these interventions were just to help us and keep, keep us in check. We certainly don't need the IMF to always, you know, come in to tell us what to do. And I think even in 2016, the IMF was, was with us. We, we, we exceeded our, our deficit in an election year. I'm just hoping that we would demonstrate some responsibility, fiscal responsibility, so that there would be a difference in 2020 that we said we we're going to have a cap of 5%. We didn't go below it. And the 4.5 that the finance minister talked about said it's, it's, it's commendable. The minority contested that, that they don't believe in the competitions of that particular 5%. That's a, that's a position they hold on to. But my point is that we have put self checks in place Nobody put pressure on us to put that law in place. Nobody indeed told us and put pressure on us to put a council in place. We deemed it necessary and fit to con put in these measures and these structures in place to keep us in check. And that's why we did it. I think the most reasonable thing to do is to go by our word. Let's well, just because, let's just see what because but let's do years, what we, we, we said we would do but, and, and that's it. Mm, well, I guess essentially that's because over the years we've seen this trajectory. We, we've seen this uh, government often within their first years, you know, they chalk all these beautiful successes, uh, you know, growth rates, inflation rates, single digit infl inflation, treasury bill rates going down. And then suddenly in election years, you know, expenditure just spirals and then we come back to the same point again so mm. uh, i mean i suspect that was the rationale behind uh, you know coming up with this with this law uh, to see, put we, a check we, on we, us we've had a penchant mm. of putting together laws and not obeying it mm. and that's what i'm saying that we can't keep doing the same things mm. and expect different results i mean if it's an election year do we have to necessarily always you know have to exceed our deficits, throw the country into, you know, this state, and, and then and, and you know, after 2021, we start a, we start the whole cycle again, trying to revive what we have lost. Come on, we can't we can't move forward. We can't move forward one step and take 20 steps back. Mm. That's a vicious cycle of, you know, very backward mentality, and and that's not certainly good for the kind of path that we want to take. And, and you know, one thing that's also commendable is that we see some improvements in the trade deficit. I mean, it's moved from about $1.8 billion in 2016 to some $2.6 billion in August 2019. And, and that is amazing that we're not having that, essentially we're, trade, I'm talking about trade deficit. Mm -hmm. well, well, know, we now have a trade surplus actually, you know, and it's, it's positive news. It, it will help in showing up the value of, see, of, of our currency. Well, pa, yes, but, but in every, in fact, the global economics and policies are geared towards answering the question of sustainability. Mm. It's not just about chalking these successes and putting these figures up, which I must admit are indeed commendable. Mm. It is not just about the now. How sustainable are these well, gains? Well, 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 well. Th this, that this, is the I, critical I, question mm. that we should be asking mm. and demanding to see the clear structures policies, mechanisms in place you're not seeing to that. sustain these gains. You're not it's just that. a matter of time. 12 yeah. months is ahead of you're, us. You're you see, there, there is a very, very difficult, you know, situation or balancing act of the national budget against people's expectations, especially in an election year. You know, so if this government is able to scale over that hurdle of balancing the budgetary, you know, uh, projections against people's expectations, then we would have, you know, something to say. And so I, I am saying that let's, let's begin the fiscal year with some optimism and hope that they will just do what they said they will do mm. so that we can see some sustainability. I am very interested in asking the sustainability question of every gain that this government has made.
That's, that's my concern and that's where for me I stand. Okay, for example, NAPCO, right? It's been 13 months. Well, it, last month was about 12 months we introduced NAPCO, okay? This intervention was supposed to solve unemployment partially. The president gave an order during the one year celebration of NAPCO that these NAPCO trainees should be the first point of call when there is any employment opening in the, the private sector. If indeed that's the case, then we would actually see some benefits to it. But we had over 95,908, that's the figure of NAPCO trainees, who were paid 700 CDs every month. Simple calculation. If you multiply 95,000, but if you can help me with that even, multiply 95,000 by 908, and then you multiply that by 12, you will get the total amount of money, all things being equal, that has been spent on these NAPCO trainees. If we juxtapose that with the gains that we have made over the 12 months that these NAPCO trainees have actually been working, mm -hmm. we will make some sense out of it whether indeed it was worth devoting this money mm -hmm. and paying these trainees. How are we even measuring their productivity? I believe that the 12 months when we were celebrating the one year, one mm -hmm. of the things I was expecting was to see a productivity report mm -hmm. that this 95,908 trainees who were paid 700 cities, our money, mm. were able to achieve the number of targets that were given to them. Because remember, there were modules under NAPCO, the revenue module and others. I'm sure these revenue people were giving targets. Were they able to achieve it? Then we do a critical review of such government programs so that when we're devoting money again in the next budget, 2020 fiscal year, we will have enough justification to say that, look, NAPCO was paid this amount, they brought in something more than that, and so we should continue, you know, the program. Mm. That is the kind of conversation that I believe that would help us all going forward. Okay, we need to move uh, forward. We need to wrap up the conversation, yeah. but um, there's quite a lot more that we could have spoken about. Um, so this is where we wrap up. I think one thing is clear that um, every, every year would have the budget being read. I think since uh, I started monitoring the budget, we, we've never had a budget surplus. In fact, it, it will never happen, you know. It will never happen. Well, so well, often, we'll often we project to spend an amount of money, you know, or raise an amount of revenue. Meanwhile, expenditure is always more than the revenue. So we need to get money from somewhere, you know, to, to, to help us to expend that extra amount. Then that will constitute <laughs> our... Our, our deficit and, and we need to fund that deficit. We need to find money from somewhere to fund that deficit and that's always been the problem. The challenge for us, like you said and like we all agree, is that we need to increase revenue mobilization. We need to. And for me, I, I think that the finance minister's challenge, which he himself has given, is the fact that we need to increase our tax to GDP ratio. And currently below 30%, we need to move to 20% and then we'll see what policies they're going to put in place for us to meet that target. Well, that's it for the stand to came to life here for my studios at TV3. My name is Park Kusia. Sorry, thanks very much, Alfred, for your time. God willing, we'll see you same time next week. Bye-bye.